It segues very nicely into the Radical Emissions Reduction Conference, which is happening in December at the Royal Society. So my question is, what can it achieve? Isn't this just the bargaining phase in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's coping with dying uh, stage, <laughs> stages of grief? Um, hmm. the, the, my, my view at the moment is that the science is sufficiently uncertain to give us a window of opportunity. It may well be that, we, that it's too late, but we'll never know that until it is too late. Um, so at the moment, the science is not sufficiently tight to say you've left it too late for 3, 4, 5 degrees C, whatever that is. What it tells us is there are ranges of probabilities. And every day that we fail, which we will fail you know, more today and then it'll be even worse tomorrow, every day that we fail to address climate change, then the probabilities of doing anything, anything significant reduce or the probabilities of higher levels of climate change increase. But at the moment, we still have an outside chance of avoiding what we might classify as dangerous climate change, and therefore it is worth, worth trying. But then it comes, well, how does this conference play out within that? A lot of people think that the technology can solve the problem for us, and what I mean by that is the supply technologies, that we can do a lot with low carbon energy supply. And I'm a great fan of energy supply and low carbon technologies, the sort of things that I've worked on for a lot of my life, and actually as an engineer, I find them really quite exciting. But they will take a long time to put in place, not to invent in the first place, we have many of them anyway, but actually to put them in place will take a long time, as in probably two to three decades, to significantly shift from the energy system we have today to a very low carbon energy system that we'd need to hold two or three degrees C. Um, and the, if we don't do something about the emissions in the shorter term, well, we might as well forget those things anyway. So the question then is, can we give ourselves this wind of opportunity to build the low carbon energy supply network and system and can we get that window of opportunity it comes about from reducing our energy demand in the short term whilst we don't have low carbon supply? So the only way we can get our carbon emissions down significantly now is to reduce the amount of energy we consume because that energy comes from high carbon energy supply systems. So if we reduce the demand now, that gives us a bit of a window of opportunity to put the energy supply in place. So we need radical reductions now and then if you like a Marshall plan for putting in place um, at low carbon energy supply. If you ally those two together, I think there's still an outside chance of us avoiding the two degree C, well at least the two stroke three degree C classification of dangerous climate change. Um, I think we're on the cusp of, you know, of, of, of leaving it too late. But I still think, and our own work here leads me to the hypothesis that actually we still have, we still have an opportunity on the demand side to give us time and scope to put in low carbon supply. And hence we've got the conference, that's the purpose of the conference. It's not just to, as academics and a, a, a joyous event that we'll go along and get on well with each other and enjoy, enjoy our interesting academic um, papers and discussions. It's actually, I think there's a very serious purpose behind it about trying to lay out what would be the framework for that low carbon, um, sort of that low um, radical reductions in emissions future. When I say the future, it's about now over the next 10 years. So the conference has to be, has to be a, a catalyst for very rapid action. We can't have this conference, then another conference in three years' time, another one in five years' time. It, you know, this has to be something that starts to trigger a significant change in how we might see these sets of issues and start to act on them. Traditionally, the people who attend these conferences tend not to be the decision makers. They send the office junior or they attend for their presentation that they're giving and then they run off to another meeting. Yes. I mean, yeah. have you got decision makers coming to the conference for more than just their presentation? Initially, when we were trying to sort of lay out this conference, we were thinking about it in terms of this, this, the, the wider array of people that we may want to come along to it. In the end, it turned out to be more of an academic conference. And actually, I think there's some, there's some merit in that. So I think this is a conference that we, we might get some decision makers there, but and it would be very nice if they were there. But this is actually for us to start to, to lay out some academic terrain um, that, that we can then go, I think, to the decision makers with. Because actually without doing that, I think we, we, we would be speaking without having a real solid understanding of what are the sorts of issues, what are the barriers, what are the opportunities to actually bring about radical reductions in, in energy consumption in the short term. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a prelude to engaging with the decision, with the decision makers. It would be nice if some of them are along at this event. At the moment, I think most, most of them, if you try to engage them with this, would just say this is you know, politically not viable. And that's a language we hear even from academics. But if we can't start ourselves to question this, um, then I think we've got no hope of actually engaging with the policy makers. And I, I take the view that actually you know, politics is something that we make. Um, it's up to us to make it viable. So I, I don't think there's a politically unviable future 
um, it's in a sense that it's, you know, it's, it's up to us to make the politics deliver on what it has to deliver on. And in some respects, you can argue if we don't do something about mitigation, well, the, the adaptation future from a political point of view looks fairly challenging as well. Um, so, you know, which, which is the more challenging to, to politics? I don't know. And I would say we're better off to mitigate first and then you know, reduce the level of adaptation we need to put in place. Looking forward to meeting Naomi Klein, and are you going to be asking for her autograph, or do you think she's going to be asking for yours? Uh, I, I've never believed in the great and the good. Um, I like the work that I've read of Cla Naomi Klein's. Um, you know, she seems to be interested in the work that we've done here. Um, you know, she, she's making she's an important part of the system that is bringing climate change to the fore. But and just as an important part are my colleagues in the other room here who sit behind their computers day in day out working on climate change. So I, I never I, I don't I've never believed in the great and good in air, any area of this world. The only person that I think probably would hold above that possibly possibly Nelson Mandela, and I'd be struggling to put anyone else in that sort of category. So that's not how I see the world. I'm looking forward to meeting but I'm looking forward to meeting lots of other people at the conference. And um, normally I say anything else you'd like to say. I suppose I'm going to change that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to offer you a bully pulpit. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask my tricky question. Five years from now, what will we regret not having done between 2013 and 2018? To know what we, what we would regret we hadn't done, I have to make some assumptions about what we have and haven't done as well. I actually think that the, the next five years, for countries like the UK and the wealthier parts, the, the, the principal emitting countries of the world, and in that I also include the people within some of the other countries like China, the 300 million people in China who live lives like those of us, relatively wealthy ones within the EU, that if those of us, the high emitting, principally the high emitting people on the planet, if we have not radically reduced our emissions, we would have effectively locked the future into a high, into a high carbon future, and we would have locked the poor people in the, around the planet our own children and most of the other species into a future that will be um, somewhere between you know, detrimental, disastrous, it's hard to know exactly how that will play out, but it's not a future that you would want to bequeath to your own children, let alone other people's children and, 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 to, and to the planet itself. I think we, we are on that, on that cusp that, that the rate of emissions growth is so rapid if we don't come off that curve in five years from now, I think the emissions will be almost so high that we'll be talking about three, four degrees C type futures. And what we might have triggered, out, triggered then are some of these other feedbacks, which we know are there, and quite rightly are not including within most of the modelling, because they're not sufficiently well understood. We know they're there, and we know they likely make the situation worse. Our big concern is actually once they start to, to kick in, that they may well take control over from what we actually do. Um, and some, there are already some scientists, because there's sufficient uncertainty here, who argue that we've already probably passed that, that, passed that point. But it's very hard for it in science. Is that science is a very complex area, and we don't know, you know, exactly where we are on this sort of um, spectrum of climate change. What we know is we're pointing very much in the wrong direction. Some people think we've left it too late. Others think we have a few more years. But when they say a few more years, I mean, they're five years is is taking up most of that envelope of, of the opportunity that we have.